Good morning, welcome to the Tuesday seminar. And uh, today we have Thomas Bloom for, uh, from the University of Cambridge to tell us about arithmetic progressions, uh, both background and recent breakthrough. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, it's an honor to speak at the Institute. Um, so this is quite a long seminar and I've divided it into uh, two halves. So the first half is going to be um, a bit of a sort of a general introduction and background. Um, so even if you've sort of never even heard of Roth theorem on three term progressions before and are completely new to the area, hopefully there should be um, um, something in this talk for you. And I'll mention this new result due to myself and Olofsky Sask and then also give a high level overview of the proof. So that's going to be the first half of the talk, um, the first hour. And then there's going to be a short break, just sort of while I um, get the slides up and everything. And then I'm going to go into a bit more in depth into one particular aspect of the proof, which I think is quite interesting. And it's um, building on previous work of Bateman and Katz. And it's on something called additively non-smoothing sets, which I think are of completely independent interest. And I've sort of tried to write the second half of the talk so it's completely independent of the first half. So you don't need to know anything at all about three term progressions going into the second half of the talk. And if you want, you can um, sort of go away now and come back for the second half if you've seen some of this introduction already. Okay. So first of all, um, Roth theorem is a um, topic in additive combinatorics. If you're completely new to the area, you might ask what's additive combinatorics about, and in particular, what makes it different from, say, number theory or more um, conventional combinatorics. And um, most of the questions in additive combinatorics revolve around finding weak additive structures under weak hypotheses. Um, so it's the additive structures that obviously make it additive combinatorics rather than regular combinatorics. Um, but in particular, I want to stress that it's under very weak hypotheses. And that's what sort of distinguishes it from more conventional number theory. So in particular, we're not assuming anything about our set, like it's a set of primes or a set of squares or cubes and things like that. And so sort of very, very minimal information. Sorry, I, I heard something coming through. Was that a question? Uh, maybe everybody should un unmute themselves. <laughs> yeah, I, sh I should say, if you do have any questions or comments throughout the talk, then please, uh, feel free to chime in either with your microphone or if you want to type in the, in the chat window there, or I'll try and see those as they come up. Yeah, I'll try to check them for you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. So um, given this, what's the weakest kind of structure that one might ask for? And I think really arguably the weakest kind of thing that you can write down that still involves some kind of addition is a three term arithmetic progression. So that's just a set of three numbers um, of the form x, x plus d, and x plus 2d, so equal spacing between them. And so I think one of the most natural questions in additive combinatorics is what kind of conditions on a set, say a set of integers, are enough to guarantee that it contains a three-term arithmetic progression? So I think this is really a very natural question. And again, because the three-term progression is really kind of a minimal additive structure, that's really asking, well, the, What's the, what kind of conditions on a set do we need to guarantee that it contains basically any kind of additive structure at all? Um, it's quite hard really to write down any other kind of additive structure that doesn't also imply that you contain a three-term arithmetic progression. So, okay, let's make a couple of trivial remarks. So there are certainly are infinite sets of integers that contain their three-term progressions, for example, the powers of two, but these are very sparse. Um, so somehow it's, Sort of obvious they won't contain progressions just because the gaps between successive numbers keeps increasing so certainly I can't have three um, numbers in arithmetic progression. And you can try an experiment and write down some examples and you can do a bit better than the powers of two but it certainly seems that any set without three term progressions must be very sparse. Okay so you can have infinite sets but certainly it seems that in any uh, particular interval you're forced to have very few of them. And uh, at least to my knowledge, this question was first considered by Erdős and Turan in 1936. 
and um, it's a short paper, three or four pages long, and they uh, consider this problem, like how how large a set of integers can we construct without three term progressions, and they prove a couple of uh, elementary estimates, and most significantly they conjecture the following. Um, so if I have a set of natural numbers, which contains no three term progressions, then the density of this set, um, which for this purpose means if I just take a look at the, uh, the size of the intersection with the first n natural numbers, divide by n and then take the limit as n tends to infinity, uh, then that should have density zero. And in fact, so this was the original conjecture of Erdős and Turan. In later years, Erdős conjectured something even stronger. Um, so he conjectured that if a is such that it contains no three-term progressions, then not only does it have density zero, but in fact the sum of the reciprocals converges, uh, which is much stronger. Um, this is roughly equivalent to uh, saying that the this sort of density function, this size of a intersect one up to n divided by n, uh, must be little o of uh, one over log n for the sum of the reciprocals to converge. So Erdős and Turan conjectured uh, this density um, threshold in 1936, um, and it was some time before uh, that was proved. So that was by Roth in 1933. Um, so he proved uh, with an ingenious twist on the circle method, which had been around for some years by that point, that if A is such that A contains no three term progressions, uh, then uh, it has a density zero. And um, it took even longer for this stronger um, version to be proved. And that's the main result that I'm talking about today. So that's if A is such that A is a set of natural numbers which contains no three term arithmetic progressions, then the sum of the reciprocals converges. Okay, so which is much stronger than um, just having zero density. You really must be quite sparse for that to happen. As an immediate consequence, uh, we know that the primes have infinitely many three-term progressions, right? because as is uh, very classical, uh, some of the reciprocals of the primes diverges. Even though they're fairly sparse, um, there's enough of them so that the sum of the reciprocals diverges. But <coughs> that was actually already known since the 1930s. I'm saying Vinograd or Esterman and uh, van der Korput using the circle method um, actually prove that already about the primes. And in fact, we can do something stronger that if I take any dense subset of the primes, then that has infinitely many three term arithmetic progressions. But this was also already known. So this was actually proved by Ben Green in 2005. And um, that um, result was the starting point of. Um, the now famous Green Tau theorem, which is a generalization of this to arbitrary length progressions. So, Green and Green and Tau uh, introduce what's now called the transference principle, which allows you to basically, in some sense, assume that the primes have a model in the integers themselves. So, a dense subset of the primes behaves like a dense subset of the integers. And then you can apply, say, Roth's theory in the integers as a black box. But what's significant is that these proofs of uh, Green and Green and Tau. They use a lot of number theoretic machinery, right? They, they're very dependent on the fact that we're working with the primes. And in fact, they use some analytic number theory estimates from a uh, sieve theory and um, from the theory of the Riemann zeta function to actually sort of get the properties of the primes that they need. And it's quite nice now we know that um, these facts about three term progressions say is true not because of any special properties of the primes, just purely on density. Um, grounds alone, right? So just take a simple estimate like Chebyshev's estimate, and that's enough to deduce that the primes contain any dense subset of the primes contains infinitely many three term progressions. And I think this sort of application is one of the main motivations of Erdős in um, conjecturing this sort of this sum of the reciprocals fact in the first place. He really wanted to know that whether it was true for combinatorial reasons that the primes contain long arithmetic progressions. Um, of course, Erdős um, didn't stop with three-term progressions. Um, he believed that, in fact, they're true for progressions of arbitrary length. 
So the analog of the first conjecture, in a, in a word, just that subsets without arithmetic progression should have density zero, um, was is much more difficult than Roth's theorem, and that was proved in 1975 by Zemmerady. Um, so in a, in a particular, if I fix any length of arithmetic progression, if I take a set without those arithmetic progressions, then that set must have density zero. And the second conjecture, this sort of uh, improving this zero density result to uh, convergence of the sum of reciprocals is still, uh, I think, completely open for the general case. So um, we proved it for k equals three. Uh, for k equals four, maybe um, you know there are some hints about the first steps about how to proceed, but certainly for k five, k equals five and larger, um, I think it's completely open. I don't think our techniques really help at all with that. And to my knowledge, I think this is the largest bounty of any surviving Erdős conjecture, three thousand um, dollars. But as has often been said, um, that's there are far far easier ways to earn three thousand dollars. So I don't recommend anyone. Uh, look did you get anything? Um, what did you get for k equals three? <laughs> uh, nothing. I don't think uh, Erdős ever offered a prize for k equals three itself. I think he was probably hoping that there'd be some proof technique that would give them all at once. Um, so. Okay, so that's a bit of general historical background. So let's get a little more specific now and just really look at the case of three term progressions. Um, so just to be clear, again, three term progression is a set of three numbers x, x plus d and x plus 2d. There is something which I sort of didn't mention earlier, which is that of course, um, every set contains a three term progression if we allow d to equal zero. Um, but such progressions are very easy to count, so generally we don't mean those when we're talking about three-term progressions. Um, so implicitly, unless I say otherwise, I'm going to be excluding such trivial progressions. And it's convenient to have a bit of um, notation for this. So R of n is the largest possible size of um, a set in the interval one up to n, which contains no non-trivial three-term progressions. So using this definition, Erdős and Turan conjectured r of n equals little o of n, for example. And in fact, in the original 1936 paper, they proved by a simple sort of elementary argument and case analysis that r of n is at most, say, 3 eighths of n, just sort of the demonstration that you can prove something about it quite easily. And as I said before, this conjecture that r of n equals little o of n was proved by Roth in 1953 with the circle method. And in fact, although this is a purely a qualitative conjecture, right? I mean, this conjecture makes no statement about how frequent, how fast it decays to zero. Um, it's very pleasing that Roth's, the first proof of this, Roth's proof, already gave a fairly reasonable quantitative upper bound. So Roth's proof gives R of n is big O of n over log log n. Up to some constant. Uh, this notation here, um, if you haven't seen it before, it's Vinogradov's notation. So this just means it's the same as equals big O of that, right? This, this is true up to some absolute const unspecified constant. So here's a sort of a, a brief uh, historical uh, tour of the progress on these bounds. So beginning with Roth in 1953, we had n over log log n. Uh, the first improvement on that came um, in, I think, first unpublished work by uh, Zemmerady. I think it was eventually published in formal conference proceedings. But Zemmerady's original strategy gave um, n times exponential in minus basically square root log log n, in particular, better than any power of log log n. Um, and then Heath Brown uh, sort of optimized Zemmerady's method to give n divided by log n to some small constant c. Um, I think in Heath Brown's paper, he has c equals 1 20th or around that. So uh, again, fairly reasonable constant. Um, this was then optimized a little further by Zemmerady, uh, who get to give the exponent 1 quarter. And that sort of really is the limit of the um, I, what I think of as the classical number theoretic method, which is Roth's M, Radian, Heath, Brown, is n to the, is log n to the one quarter as a density. Um, 
The next really big breakthrough, I think, came from uh, when Bourgain studied the problem. And he introduced, um, he sort of took the subject away from being sort of more purely analytic number theory and the circle method to embedding it in a, a more general context of harmonic analysis, uh, which in particular meant that he could work with um, something called ball set, which we'll get to later. And that's really been a, a transformation in how we think about this sort of problem. And indeed, many of the techniques that Borgan introduced here have been used all over throughout additive combinatorics and beyond. And in particular, Borgan uh, used these new ideas to improve the density threshold to uh, n over log n to the one half, uh, up to you know small errors, so up to powers of log log, which I'm not keeping track of here. Um, then the next improvement came from Morgan again, which is log n to the two thirds. Then Sanders improved this to log n to the three quarters. And then the next of significant milestone is I think in 2011 when um, for the first time, essentially this density threshold of n over log n was achieved. And this is um, a significant threshold, both because, okay, so it's actually what we need to break through if we want to get conclusions about the primes, for example, and in particular, if we want to get this Erdős conjecture about the sum of reciprocals. And curiously enough, it's actually a very natural threshold for a lot of the uh, methods, the historical methods that they sort of run into. So um, if you write down the strategy of uh, Borgan and Sanders, um, then even sort of sweeping away all the sort of technical complications and things one has to keep track of, there is a sort of a very natural uh, limit of these techniques as you get to n over log n, um, so which I think is why, which explains sort of the next you know, four entries in this table, where basically, so there was a result of myself in 2014, and then myself and Adopsi Sask last year, and then uh, most recently, the best bound, which was uh, due to Thomas Schoen um, this year, I think in around May, and oh, sorry. Yeah. this 2019 result is worse than the ones before it though. There's a seven. Um, that so the, the, the best result on this page is Schoen's uh, 2020 result. Sure, but I'm saying that they're not like in, or, in order from worst to best results because of this seven in the second to last one. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the, the um, paper of myself and obviously Sask last year um, it's slightly worse than the log log, but that in a way that wasn't really our aim. The, the point is somehow was to come up with a new technique um, for achieving basically n over log n. Um, it turned out that the log logs were slightly worse than some of these other techniques. Um, so I think really what, what happens here in both in the Sanders result in, in the last four entries on this table, it's not the case that sort of each is slightly optimizing the one that came before, in fact each one uses actually a fairly different proof. So there's actually four quite different proofs going on here and four quite different sets of ideas. And it just sort of almost by accident, all four run into the same barrier at n over log n. And it happens that they also do slightly different in the, the powers of log log. But um, I think the way to read these four entries is all basically n over log n up to some lower order terms. And so our actual main result of which this um, sum of reciprocals Erdős conjecture is a corollary is the following new quantitative upper bound, uh, which for the first time pushes us past this n over log n barrier, um, but not by much, but by enough. So our result is precisely there exists some constant C such that R of n is big O of n over log n to the one plus C. And in particular, this is little o of n over log n. Okay, okay. And you know, by something which is actually fairly um, rapidly decaying. And in particular, okay, now it's just a sort of an elementary undergraduate exercise and analysis to deduce that um, from this density bound that if A has no non-trivial three-term progressions, then the sum of the reciprocals converges. Okay, so this density upper bound is, is really the main result here. The value of the constant C here is in principle um, computable. Um, if one really wanted, you could sit down and go through every line of our paper and keep track of all the constants, uh, but it would be a real headache to do and it would be really, really tiny. So in particular, it wouldn't be anything like um, 1 20th or something that we saw in the previous slide, probably something like two to the minus two to the two to the 1,000. Okay, so um, 
not completely terrible by the standards of, um, say, Zemiradi's regularity lemma, where you might get a tower of exponents. Um, sort of it's only sort of three exponents deep, but still, you know, very, very small, but still definitely greater than zero. The actual shape of this bound um, might look a little strange um, if, if you're new to the area, but actually it's not really a surprise to people who've thought about this sort of question before, because there was this previous breakthrough work by Bateman and Katz on the cap set problem. Uh, this is in 2010. And the cap set problem is essentially the same as uh, Roth's theorem, so trying to study the density of sets without three term progressions, but um, instead of looking at it as a subset of the integers, you look at subsets of F3 to the n, which in some sense is kind of the simplest, you know, abelian group in which the notion of a three-term progression makes sense. Like in F2 to the n, because there's two torsion, um, this sort of collapses. And this is why F3 to the n is the, in some sense, the simplest setting to study this problem. And in 2010, they obtained um, an analogous up, upper bound for this cap set problem. So if you replace the integers with F3 to the n, then the bound from the previous slide uh, was already proved in 2010 by Bateman and Katz. All right, so 3 to the n is the size of our universe, which is corresponds to capital M in the previous slide, and then uh, little n to the 1 plus c is sort of log of the size of our, of our universe. Um, and the use of F3 to the n, and in general, what's called finite field models, um, has long been uh, known to be very useful in anti-combinatorics as somehow an easier version of the integers, right? I mean, a lot of the hope is that, first of all, you study these problems in F3 to the n, where you have a lot of algebraic structure, there's lots of subgroups lying around, most importantly. And then once you write down the proof for that, then you sort of hope to translate that proof to the integers and hope that the same proof you know, can be made to work. Um, this is especially true for results that use Fourier analysis, right? Because, well, um, from the point of view of Fourier analysis, they're both uh, finite abelian groups, um, in which case they both have a dual group um, just as well. And so you can write down the Fourier transform for both F3 to the n and say z mod nz and hope that the same technique should work. And I think when this result first came out, this was the hope, but it proved to be quite um, difficult and challenging to actually get the ideas of the Bateman and Katz to work for the integers. And this is in some sense what um, Olof, Susask and I have done. So we do indeed use the ideas of Bateman and Katz translated to the integers. And it's important to stress that um, definitely we would, we would not have proved our result um, without, um, basically we use all of the ideas from their earlier breakthrough. So do you think that if Kudlev Pach was, was done in the late 2000s, then uh, you would not have written this paper then? Uh, yeah, that's a great point. I mean, so I'll mention this Kutlev Pax thing in the next slide, but I think, yeah, there is a, a very plausible alternate history that could have happened where the polynomial method happened. Um, and then as a result, sort of people thought, well, I'll stop developing the Fourier anal analytic method for the cap set problem. And then it might have significantly delayed how these things, getting these things to work in the integers. So it's, it's quite luckily, lucky that it didn't work out that way. Um, but yeah, so in performing this translation from F3 to the end of the integers, it did prove to be significantly more difficult, I think, than people expected. And in particular, there are um, several quite significant new ideas that were necessary. So there are several um, obstructions that don't really uh, make themselves known in F3 to the end, um, but become really significant in the integers. So you have to do sort of a lot of extra work as well. And um, as was just mentioned, there is, in fact, a completely different method now known since Bateman and Katz for F3 to the n. So uh, a new, I think, it was, I, didn't write, I think it was 2016, uh, a new polynomial method was introduced by Krutlev and Pach, which was then applied by Ellerberg and uh, Chiswit to prove a uh, phenomenally better upper bound of, in fact, exponentially better, of roughly like 2.756 to the n for this um, Roth type quantity. Um, so, you know, after struggling so long and so many complicated ideas, the Fourier analytic path to get this sort of 3 to the n over n to the 1 plus c um, tiny improvement, 
um, it's incredible that there is this, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to go and read it now. It's basically, you can write it down on like one page of undergraduate linear algebra, um, and it gives you this phenomenal upper bound using a completely different technique. It's fantastic. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any way to adapt um, this method to the integers. So it really relies on the fact that we're in sort of fixed characteristic and very high dimension um, to really make the polynomial method work. So we're a very rigid algebraic setting. That's not, of course, saying that there isn't a way, but as far as I know, no one currently has any idea what the analog of that polynomial method should look like in the integers, which is unlike Fourier analytic techniques, of course. I mean, once you've written down an argument in Fourier analysis and F3 to the N, it's at least obvious how to start writing that argument down in the integers, right? You still have the Fourier transform available. Um. It's, it's also, this quantity is also false over the integers, right? The analogous statement is false. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, which, so on the next slide, actually, I'm going to mention what the best lower bounds are for the integers. Uh, but in particular, as was just pointed out, the analogous statement for this, um, for the integers, is false. So like, for example, it's not true that there is an upper bound of capital N to the um, 1 minus C, for example, for any constant C bigger than 0. Um, so this is this bare end uh, lower bound here. So I want to stress that, obviously, the upper bound that um, Olof and I obtain which is n over log n to the one plus c is very unlikely to be sharp, right? There's no fair universe in which that's the correct, uh, you know, with c equals two to the minus two to the two to the 1,000, where that's the correct order of growth of this function. Um, and in fact, the best lower bound is much, much smaller than this. Um, so in particular, um, this is due to Berend in 1946. There are slight refinements by Elkin and Green Wolf, um, which is the most up-to-date bounds but they don't actually change the way I've written the bounds here. Um, in particular, they, and they don't even change this constant here. So essentially this bound is still due to bare end um, and you're looking at sort of what 80 odd years old. And it's n times e to the minus basically square root log n. Up to constants. Ex uh, polynomial saving in n. Um, can anybody hear me? I feel like uh, Tom. Oh, sorry, you were you were hung for a little bit, at least from my end. Yeah, I just got a message saying my internet connection is unstable. Uh, okay. Well, let's keep going. Hope hopefully it'll be okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, so far so good. Oh, great. Um, okay, so I'm not sure at what point I started to hang. Um, so I'll go back and just say that, so we have this bare end lower bound to the minus square root uh, log n. And we believe that this lower bound is closer to the truth. So um, we conjecture that there exists some constant c bigger than zero, such that r of n is big O of e to the minus log n to c, log n to the c times n. So Behrens lower bound says that uh, c equals a half will be the best one could hope for here. Uh, it's possible that c equals a half is true. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it were. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't either. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe c equals one third, for example, was actually closer to the truth. But definitely, um, or of n is better than um, n over any arbitrary power of log n, right? So it's definitely much smaller than n, n over log n to the 100, for example. Okay, so in the rest, a very high level overview of the proof. Um, I guess now's a good time to pause though and to see if there are any questions or comments about the background section and also check you can still hear me. No, I'm worried that I've lost you again. We hear you, but uh, uh, yeah, just keep going and we'll uh, alert you if okay. <laughs> we don't. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, so um, how does our proof proceed? 
So I guess the first thing to actually say is that of the qualitative um, statements that R of n equals little o of n, there are quite a variety of different proofs now. So um, Roth's original method used the circle method. Um, but now there are proofs, um, so very purely combinatorial proofs, for example, by the triangle removal lemma and the Moradi's regularity lemma. Um, there are proofs using uh, ergodic theory instead as well. Um, but still, by far, the quantitatively best bounds have always come from uh, elaborating on the original idea of Roth. So this is uh, by using Fourier analysis and a density increment argument. And our proof is no different. So again, we sort of the basic overall structure is that of a density increment argument. The dichotomy. And roughly the idea is either A has many three-term progressions about what we'd accept, expect in a random set, or A has a strong density increment. Okay, so this is the structure part of the dichotomy. And in particular, the structure takes the form of saying that there is some arithmetic progression p inside 1 up to n such that the relative density um, of a inside p is bigger than the relative density of a inside 1 up to n. And then once you know this, then you can iterate the whole argument from the beginning, right? So because three term progressions are translation and dilation invariant, so just replace p by some other shorter interval, replace a with a corresponding dilate and shift of that intersection, um, and then you have exactly the same intervals now a little shorter, and then you iterate this. And the point is you can't continue forever because we have the trivial fact that, of course, the density of any set can't exceed one. So at some point we have to stop, and that means space and a roughly sort of um, the same count of three term progressions as in a random set. And in particular, as long as we're not too sparse, that's going to be greater than the count of the trivial progressions. So in particular, we found at least one non trivial progression. Okay, so that's um, a very high level overview of how the density increment strategy works. Of course, the final quantitative strength of this result is going to depend a lot on what we feed into it. So there's two significant parameters here. There's how much does the density of A increase at each stage? So this affects how many times uh, we actually have to run the iteration for. Each time costs us something, so we'd like it, this to be small. And also how much we've lost in sort of the size of our ambient set, the size of our universe at each stage. Okay. Because trivially, if I pass from 1 up to n, I, I could pass from 1 up to n down to, say, just a progression of length 1, and I have massive density at that on some translate of that. But of course, that's essentially useless because the size of my universe has shrunk so much. So we want to make sure that the density of A goes up by um, something reasonably large, and the size of our universe decreases by something not too small. OK, so how does this dichotomy actually work? So either we want to show there are many progressions, or A has some structure. Um, the first step, as I've said, we're going to use Fourier analysis. So we're going to apply orthogonality to write the count of three-term progressions as a sum in Fourier space. And it's convenient to pretend that 1 up to n is a finite abelian group of order n. Okay. And essentially, yeah, so you can just work with z mod nz. That's equivalent for our purposes. Um, so of course, because it's a finite abelian group, we have a dual group of characters, which are just the homomorphisms from g to the unit circle. And they obey the standard orthogonality relationships, which means in particular that if I'm looking at the count of three term progressions in A, so that's on the left hand side here, I can just express this um, linear condition x plus y equals 2z, which is what's saying that x, y, and z are in arithmetic progression uh, using characters. And then if I define the Fourier transform by just um, so one, hat, one sub A hat of at gamma is just the average of the, um, well, the character gamma applied to A, then this means that I can write the number of three-term progressions in A as basically the sum over all gamma of the Fourier transform cubed. Okay, so there's a minus two here in one of the factors, but um, that's no need to concern yourself. The contribution from the trivial character here is easy to calculate. And in fact, it's the one, only one that's easy to calculate, right? Because um, all we know about A 
you know, from, um, from the face of it is that it's de is it density. So we have no information at all about how it's um, sort of interact with any of the other sort of substructures and one up to n. So the only Fourier coefficient we can really hope to say anything about is the trivial one. Um, where obviously gamma of x is equal to one for all x and therefore the Fourier coefficient is just alpha, which is the density of A, so the size of A divided by N. So in particular to this sum, uh, the trivial Fourier, co Fourier coefficient contributes alpha cubed. And we expect that's the main term. So we expect the trivial character to, con to contribute to the main term. All other characters should belong in the error term. So that gives us this expression here for the number of three term progressions. And in particular, um, if we're not in the sort of the randomness part of this dichotomy, then the main term doesn't dominate. And so the error term has to exceed the main term, which um, if you look back at this, then for the error term to exceed the main term in particular means that this cubic sum over all non-trivial characters has to be at least alpha cubed um, times some constant. Okay, so what do we do next? Um, there are a number of ways you can proceed. I think the what is now the most elegant way is to uh, apply dyadic pigeonholing to this. Okay, so we have this is a sum over all non-trivial characters, um, and for purposes of what comes next, the cleanest thing to do is to sort of pigeonhole this um, into dyadic ranges of how how large these Fourier coefficients actually are, and then just select the range with um, to contribute the most mass to this cubic sum. Um, that means we really want to look at the set of Fourier coefficients which are large. So I'm going to define the eta large spectrum by um, the set of all gamma such that the absolute value of the Fourier coefficient at gamma is at least eta times alpha. Okay, so the trivial upper bound for this quantity is alpha just by the triangle inequality but this is really saying we have sort of an eta proportion of the maximal possible size of this Fourier coefficient. And by this dyadic pigeonholing trick that I mentioned, so I'll omit the details, just to sort of check on the back of an envelope that this is what it gives you, um, you can deduce from this lower bound for the cubic sum that there is some eta, so some sort of spectral level between one and alpha, such that the size of such that sort of that spectral level is what's really contributing to the left hand side of this cubic sum, uh, which in particular means that the size of the spectrum must be at least eta to the minus three. Right? So if, the, if we look at the left hand side of this sum here, restricted to delta sub eta, and if that's contributing roughly alpha cubed, then that must be because the size of the spectrum is eta to the minus three. Okay, and that's essentially the main point to take away from this, what we've done so far. So at that point, you can basically forget about three-term progressions. You can forget about um, density increments and everything else. Uh, the key point is, if I tell you that I have a set A such that, and I tell you there is some spectral level eta between one and alpha, such that the size of the spectrum is at least eta to the minus three, then what can you tell me about A? Okay, that's sort of what remains. And the kind of information that we want to sort of feed into the next step of our iterative argument is that there exists some kind of progression P on which A has increased density. Okay, so we can't actually do that with arithmet arithmetic progressions, or at least one can, but it turns out to be very inefficient. Um, so I sort of written progression in quotation marks here because um, thinking of it, think of it as some kind of approximate progression if you like. So um, I'll come on to what that means a little later. So how do we find such a P? So it's some kind of approximate progression on which A has large density, uh, given the sort of spectral information that there is some level of which the large spectrum is large. Uh, there are a number of ways. I'm going to skip over the details. Um, what I really want to stress is that the main goal now is to find a subset of this eta level spectrum which has large size and small dimension. Okay, those are the two parameters that we need to, to balance against each other. Um, here by dimension, you can 
basically take what you want intuitively want dimension to mean. So for example, you can view it as the size of the minimal um, spanning subset. Okay. Um, spanning, say, with zero plus minus one coefficients. This is all sort of very flexible as to really whatever you mean by dimension, as long as you take some kind of sensible definition of dimension, um, this should all work the same. Um, and then basically you take P to be the set which approximately annihilates um, this subset of the spectrum, which um, means that P is not exactly a, a subgroup or an arithmetic progression, but it's actually the approximate annihilator of this set of characters, um, which is called a Bohr set. And as I mentioned earlier, this is sort of the key uh, significant advance of Borgan. Borgan recognized the importance of working not with arithmetic progressions, which do work, they're just very inefficient because we are forced to sort of um, go down a lot in the size of your progression at each stage. And instead you work with a Bohr set, um, which you, you can think of them as sort of smoothed high dimensional arithmetic progressions instead. So they give you a lot more flexibility to work with. So the idea is P is going to be this Bohr set, which is a set of approximate annihilators. And we want this to be uh, not too small. But then again, the main takeaway from this slide is that we want to find a subset of this eta level spectrum with large size and small dimension. Okay, so there are two parameters to balance here how large the size is and how small the dimension is. And of course, they're sort of in conflict, right? If I, if I take a bigger set, then that's um, good for the size, but possibly I'm picking up um, more in the dimension. And this exactly mirrors the two parameters that we have to balance in the density increment procedure. So the size controls how much the density of A goes up. Um, so the, the bigger our set of characters is, the bigger the subset of our spectrum is, the more density we gain in A. And the dimension controls by how much sort of the size of our universe goes down at each stage. Okay. Um, this is roughly because the dimension of our set of characters corresponds to the co-dimension of our Bohr set. Okay, so if we, we want that to be small to make sure that the size of the Bohr set or the size of the approximate progression remains relatively large. Okay, but now at this point you can forget about density increment and just focus on the task of finding a subset of the spectrum with large size and small dimension. So where are we starting? So we're starting with some spectrum, delta sub eta, with size eta to the minus three. So what's the natural thing to do? Well, we should start by what happens if we take all of this spectrum. Okay, this has really good size, size eta to the minus three, and trivially the dimensions also at most eta to the minus three, right? Trivially a set spans itself. And you can indeed feed those parameters in and you know, turn the handle and run this density increment procedure, and it would deliver something like r of n is bigger than n over log n to the one third. If you've sort of put these two parameters in. Okay, so how we want to improve on this upper bound. So the first natural question is, uh, is this trivial upper bound of the dimension really sharp? Okay, so let's just still take the whole spectrum, size e to the minus three, can we improve the dimension? Um, so of course not in general, there are sets whose dimension equals their size. If I just take a set of linearly independent things. Uh, but we're not dealing with um, a completely arbitrary set here, right? We're dealing with a set of characters with large Fourier coefficients. Okay, so the, the set is given to us by some sort of fairly structured um, way. So we expect there to be some kind of structure. And so it's reasonable to hope that maybe for, in our particular case, we can actually get a better bound of the dimension than this trivial e to the minus three. Okay. And indeed uh, we can. So Chang was the first to find the existence of some such structure. In fact, she didn't do this um, for the purpose of Roth's theorem. It was um, another application in additive combinatorics improving the bound for um, Freiman's theorem. Um, but very loosely, it says something like the following, um, that if I have, and this applies very generally. So if I have any spectrum, uh, any eta level spectrum of a set A, so any eta, any A, um, no additional hypotheses at all, then it has dimension basically big O of eta to the minus two. Okay. 
so which is a definite improvement on this trivial bound of e to the minus three. Okay, there's a sketch proof there, which I'll um, omit for the purpose of time, but it's a very nice idea. You sort of find, you show that the spectrum has many additive relations. Um, if I have too large a linearly independent set, then that can't contain too many additive relations, and then you get a contradiction. But in particular, in our application, we just apply this straight off. So we have size e to the minus three and dimension e to the minus two. And because this is strictly better, right, the size is the same, the dimension's gone down by a factor of eta. Um, this, as one would expect, gives a improvement in the upper bound for r of n, and we get an upper bound of n over square root log n, if one does the argument this way. This isn't actually what Paul Gann did. Um, Paul Gann did something slightly different. Um, he didn't use Chang Clemmer at all, for example. But this is sort of an, an alternative route, I guess, to uh, n over log n to the one half. Okay, so this is in a sense best possible. Um, in fact, just around the time Chang's lemma was proved, Ben Green already showed it was sharp by constructing sets A such that the eta level spectrum of A has size eta to the minus two um, and also dimension eta to the minus two. Right? So their spectrum is eta to the minus two, basically linearly independent characters. But this is not the situation we're in, right? We definitely know that our spectrum has size eta to the minus three, not eta to the minus two. So whatever's going on, we're definitely not in this sort of um, unfortunate situation um, that Ben Green constructed. So given this, one can ask the question of, can we improve the dimension bound from Chang's lemma, given that we have so many characters to begin with, right? given that we have such a big size, e to the minus three to begin with? Um, the answer is yes. So this is um, what I proved in 2014. So there is a set, um, a subset of the spectrum, which is basically, so I've lost a factor of eta in the size, but I've gained a factor of eta in the dimension. Okay, so it's size eta times the size of my spectrum overall, but the dimension bound is now um, eta to the minus one rather than eta to the minus two. And um, it, it's a similar sort of idea to how one can prove Chang's lemma, but you sort of use um, random sampling as well. And this, and this proof was inspired by Again, something similar that Bateman and Katz did in their 2010 paper. Okay, so it's not clear that um, one, this actually does give you a gain because although I've gained a factor of eta in the dimension, I've lost a factor of eta in the size, but it turns out that, um, in fact, this is a trade-off we're happy to make and running this doesn't give you an improvement. And this is how um, in my 2014 paper, I got the n over log n. So this is great, but again, it's running into this logarithmic barrier. So how do we get past this logarithmic barrier? Um, again, we can't improve on this lemma. You can construct sets A such that this lemma is best possible. And in particular, you can't hope to find large subsets of the spectrum with any small dim smaller dimension. Um, and instead, and this is sort of the global strategy of Bateman and Katz, we ask not for just a lot, for like a single large structured piece inside the spectrum, but we want to decompose the entirety of the spectrum into structured pieces and then study how those pieces interact with each other. And what makes this possible is that we have quite a lot of control over the additive energies of the spectrum. Okay, so I'm gonna be slightly brief here because this part of the proof is precisely what I'm going to go, going to go into in more detail in the <clears throat> second, second hour of the seminar. <clears throat> so if you want more details, sort of wait till that half. But roughly the idea is um, the fourfold additive energy of the spectrum, which just counts the number of four tuples, which lie in this particular additive relation, we can assume that that's roughly e to squared times the size of delta cubed. And the eightfold additive energy, um, which is the same thing just with um, sort of double the number of summons, is roughly e to the six times delta to the seven. The lower bounds here come from the fact that we're dealing with a spectrum and holders inequality. Um, it's a sort of, it's almost a one line application of holders inequality. The upper bounds um, aren't obvious. And in fact, we can't guarantee they always hold. But what we can say is that if they don't hold, then the previous bounds, so coming from, say, Chang's lemma and variants thereof, uh, work much more efficiently. The hey, idea sorry, 
can I interrupt you for a second? Yep. So I was following you until now. Um, so could you say a word about the, what the additive energies are? Yeah, um, they're precisely what I've written down here. So the, um, again, uh, this will come up properly in the second half of the talk. Oh, oh okay, okay, that's fine then. Yeah, you can, um, but I can wait. The quantities on the, on the two left hand side here are additive energies. So they're just counting the number of solutions to these linear equations. Um, okay. And in particular, these kind of bounds that we have, okay, so don't worry too much for now about the particular forms that they take. The main point is that they mean that the spectrum is what's called an additively non-smoothing set. Now again, I'm not going to say what that means here because the entire second half of the seminar is going to be about additively non-smoothing sets. Um, but for now, you can just think of them as sets such that their additive energies look like this, such that the counts of these solutions to linear equations and have this form. And Bateman and Katz proved a structural theorem for such sets, um, which in this particular application means that we can decompose the spectrum delta as h plus x, where h uh, is a very structured set, so you can think of it as being a subgroup, for example, or an approximate subgroup like an arithmetic progression of size e to the minus one and dimension, what, big O of one. Okay, so it's very structured. And X is just a completely random set. It's just a completely random collection of shifts of H. Um, so I haven't written it down here, but uh, X has size e to the minus two, right? So for the full set delta to have size e to the minus three, I take e to the minus two disjoint translates of this structured set H. And that's what our spectrum in fact looks like. Okay, so we haven't just found a single sort of structured subset of delta of the spectrum. We've actually decomposed the whole of the spectrum into these, um, uh, this particular form, so it translates of some fixed h. I know this is consistent with what we were uncovering earlier, right? So if I, in particular, if I take, uh, say, e to the minus one translates of h, and I look at h plus those translates, then I've discovered a subset of my spectrum of size e to the minus two and dimension e to the minus one, for example which is precisely what my lemma from 2014 guarantees exists. So this is somehow like a much more um, precise form of that. So unfortunately, we can't just apply the structural results of Bateman and Katz as a black box, um, basically because we're not actually working, in our iterative argument, we're not working with subsets of groups, we're working with subsets of Bohr sets. And this means that and both sets are not groups, right? Just like arithmetic progressions are not groups. They're approximately groups. They have some kind of additive structure, but they're not precise algebraic groups. And this means that um, we cannot work, we can't just sort of quotient out by things and assume that we're always inside a subgroup, of, always dense inside a subgroup. So one of the main new contributions um, of my paper with obviously Sask is that we had to sort of extend this structural result of Bateman and Katz to handle um, not just additive energies, energies, but additive energies relative to approximate groups. And again, I'll say more about what that actually looks like and what that means uh, in, the, in the second half of the talk. But the takeaway is, again, we can assume that the spectrum has this form, delta equals h plus x. Okay, so are we done? What can we do with this decomposition? So we could look at H itself as a subset of delta. So now we have a set of size e to the minus one dimension big O of one. Um, and again, we've sort of gained and lost here. We've gained a factor of eta in the dimension. We've lost a factor of eta in the size. Does this gain anything? Uh, no, you still get an over log n. Okay, so you sort of, at this point, the trade-offs exactly cancel each other out and you still don't get past the logarithmic um, density barrier. This is sort of comes up a lot when you're, this is, I think this is one of the reasons that um, a lot of techniques run into a barrier and over log n because you can start to make trade-offs there, but they always just sort of exactly cancel each other out. And it's really hard to get any sort of gain to push you past. Okay, so how do Bateman and Katz get past this logarithmic barrier? So they have a solution that works when we're in F3 to the n. Roughly, the idea is I look at h plus x primed, where x primed is some suitable subset chosen randomly of x, 
um, the dimension goes up, but the size also goes up. And there is, you can sort of tweak this to actually get a small win in F. Um, can, can you turn off your speaker? If you're the, edge. the viewers? And well, let's say, let's say something is easy. I want, okay. I want every node to touch at least a single Shahar. edge. Okay, very simple. I want every node to have at least a mm. one. I don't know why Shahar. So if you choose P to be one over N, then with constant probability, That's a node has agreed. It sounds like it's from a different talk. Anyways, it's okay now. Okay. Yeah, it stopped from me. So take a okay. union bundle of all and not this logins and login over n. But so this is where you do this login, and this happens oh, in many other similar. Super weird. So now it's the car isn't even here. This I know. Is I think like it's, a recording of Shikoski. Oh, no. Yeah, I think it's like a recorded talk, and I don't know why it's showing up. Now you can ask about how far can I... this framework. <laughs> Um, let me, I'll send a quick email. Who, who's playing the recording of Chikhov? Tom, uh, just yeah. wait a second. We'll, uh, oh. yeah, 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 Tom, wait a second. <laughs> uh, yeah. The host can mute everyone. Then no, he's not even on. Tight, so, I mean, whether you're trying to find satisfying conditions, or we have another example that I haven't shown you. Let's show that your set of the case spread, but it does not have three digits. Like, even if, even does not have two digits, it's in the second set. Tony, can you mute yourself for a second? Wait, well, he's talking yeah. about our paper. I like this. I like this. This is good. People are going to hear about my paper. <laughs> so I think it came from your computer, Tony. May I ask a question? Mm. I was just wondering, at what point does the proof, or maybe there are many, uh, does it resist extension to five-term APs? Yeah, um, basically almost at every possible point. So even the very first thing I wrote down, so expressing the count of three-term progressions as a Fourier sum, um, if you want to do that, say, for five-term progressions, then right, the most natural way to do that is write down a system of um, three linear equations and five variables, and then sort of have an average over three different three different averages over Fourier characters. Um, and basically, I mean, the whole thing breaks down. Right, you can't just sort of say either we have the right count of five term progressions or we have some large Fourier coefficients. So at that point, already it breaks down. You won't have that dichotomy. You mean? Sorry. You won't have that dichotomy. That yeah. you could use. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and that failed even for four term progressions. So, there are sets with like not many four term progressions, but also all their Fourier coefficients are small. Um, and the correct way to get around that is with the machinery of um, Gower's um, uniformity norms and higher order Fourier analysis. Which which is extend. Okay, thank you. It seems Quite that uh, at least the recorded talk stopped talking. Uh, yeah. So, Tom, maybe you can uh, yeah, continue with the first part, I guess. Yep. Most. Okay, so I'll finish this first part. Um, so as I say, for the industries, you can't get a win this way. And instead, this is the other sort of the second main new thing that we introduce, which is called spectral boosting. Um, so for this, we still just work with H. We don't increase the size of H at all. Um, we like H because it has very small dimension, it's dimension big O1, which is great for us. It's just that the size is a little small. And instead, we don't change the size or the dimension, we change the actual spectral level parameter eta. So here's, a, here's a, I think, a good way to think about spectral boosting. It can be thought of as a partial converse to a result of Borgan. So Borgan showed that approximately, if I have the eta to the one half level spectrum and I add it to itself, that is mostly a subset of the eta level spectrum. Okay, so the eta level spectrum approximately contains this subset of the eta to the half level spectrum. Okay, so in other words, the translates of the eta to the half level spectrum forms a structured subset of the eta level spectrum. Spectral boosting, uh, which you introduce in this paper, says that roughly the converse holds. And in fact, if we have a structured subset of the eta level spectrum, it must be basically because it comes from a translate of the eta to the one half level spectrum, or a subset, it's a subset of that. Okay, so it's, Basically, this is why we call it spectral boosting, because we're recovering from the fact that it has some kind of structure, that not only is it a subset of the eta spectrum, but we can boost that spectral level to eta to the one half, which is much more powerful. So in particular, we can deduce that some translate of H, which is very structured, 
is a subset of the e to the one half level spectrum of size e to the minus one and dimension still big O one. Okay. And now we're happy with this size because we've gotten so much better at the spectral level. The proof of spectral boosting, um, it uses the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in both the physical space and the Fourier space and sort of you have to bounce between them. Um, and also it makes very crucial use of um, almost periodicity, which is a new technique introduced in relative combinatorics, I think around 2010 again by Krut and Cisask. Um, and that sort of probabilistic sampling entirely in physical space. So I won't sort of discuss the proof of spectral boosting at all here. So I'm just going to conclude by saying that the new tools we introduced, so that's the structure for non-smoothing sets and spectral boosting, these actually tools are very efficient. They work very well. And if that's all we really have to worry about, then we'd get really good upper bound for R of n, almost sort of comparable, comparable to this bare end lower bound. Unfortunately, we're still using at some other parts relatively crude bounds. Okay, so these sort of these old, more historic parts of the proof uh, that we have to couple with these new techniques. And there is a balancing act to do about sort of the gains that one gets from the new tools versus you know, how bad the loss is from these older, older techniques. But the point is that the new techniques are powerful enough that the sort of the, that side of the scales is now you know, pulled down by quite a lot. So you can actually get past the logarithmic barrier. So it's really the reason we can get past the logarithmic barrier is that um, especially spectral boosting is so amazingly efficient that it sort of more than makes up for all the losses in the other parts of the proof. Um, just as an aside, I think the weakest part uh, of the proof is how we obtain the upper bound for the additive energy. So if you're interested in how to improve this result, I think that's really the place to look. And I think if a new technique, if somebody came up with a new idea about how to get upper bounds for the additive energy of spectra, then I think that would fairly quickly lead to significantly better bounds for R, for R of n, uh, if you're interested in that. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize the, the proof now, and I'll take um, a break for a couple of minutes. So the proof of our result uses basically all the ideas that have come before for Roth's theorem. So the density increment strategy, um, going back to Roth, four sets as introduced by Pogan, uh, and the theory was further developed extensively by Sanders. Um, almost periodicity um, of Krut and Cisask, um, Chang's lemma, which I said was introduced actually for Freiman's theorem, but it's proved very useful since, additive and unsmoothing, um, and all the structural ideas from the work of Bateman and Katz. And there are two significant new pieces that we add to that. So as well as sort of doing all that in the integers, um, there are two significant new pieces that are present in our work. So first is a structural result for additively non-smoothing sets that works for approximate energies. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in the second half of the talk. And also spectral boosting. Right? So spectral boosting means that the structure we obtained from our structural results, we can therefore exploit that to get a really high level of spectral information. Okay, and I'll stop the first part of the talk there. And I'll break for a couple of minutes if there's any questions and to change slides. I, I have one question. Uh, from where exactly uh, the partition of the spectra uh, gives you more than a large subset? Maybe I missed something you said. Um, right, so it's, it's because um, in particular, I found this sort of much smaller, very structured piece H, which is very structured, but very small. And I know that interacts with the entire spectrum very efficiently, right? So it's sort of, it's basically, the entire spectrum is closed under shifts from H. Okay, and that's- so, so, so it's really arithmetic, basically. Yeah, um, it's, it's, yeah. that's what the spectral yeah, boosting that, uses. Yeah, so, and it is this structure that you later use, um, yeah, in the, in, well, I guess in both, in the energies and in the boosting. Yeah, so it, it's sort of, it's hidden in the, the proof of spectral boosting, which I didn't discuss at all, but that's where we use, that we really have the full decomposition of the spectrum, I guess, rather than just a larger piece. So spectral boosting really does rely on that. Any more questions? This was beautiful. <laughs> So maybe we take a five minute break and uh, 
uh, come back and Tom will proceed with the gory details or some of them, very few of them. Okay. Five minutes. I'm just going to get some water. Yeah, sure. A couple of things more. Let's see who, who the diehards are. Tom, perhaps it's, it's worth saying that uh, additive energy, you wrote, uh, you wrote what it means, but uh, it's, a, it's a measure of arithmetic structure. Yeah. Some, or some measure of arithmetic structure. The equations have to be satisfied. You have two tuples or four tuples, or whatever it adds up to the same mm -hmm. It sounds mysterious when uh, you say it for people who didn't see it. Yes. Yeah, I, I should have emphasized that it, it really was just that sort of like the buzz, the phrase, if you know it, that's what I mean. But if you don't, it's not scary. It's just exactly this count of solutions that I wrote down. Yeah, but it, that it captures arithmetic structure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. So, uh, uh, yeah, five minutes have passed. I hope that everybody who wanted to come back came back. And uh, yeah, uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so welcome back, everybody. I assume this is a subset of um, the audience of the first talk, but it doesn't actually matter um, if you're new. I think this is basically completely independent of the application. It's just that it might seem a little unmotivated as to, to why we care so much about this sort of result. Um, but without knowing its place in the proof from off theorem, 
And I'm going to be talking about additively non-smoothing sets, and in particular the structural result um, that we proved for them. Okay, so my goals in this talk are first of all to tell you what an additively non-smoothing set is. Um, I think it's a relatively new concept that most of you probably won't be familiar with. Um, give some key examples of what additively non-smoothing sets are. Um, state the structural theorem for non-smoothing sets, so both the original one of Bateman and Katz and the new one that um, Olaf Tisask and I prove. And then hopefully um, I should have time at the end to give you a flavour of the kind of arguments that we're using in proof. I certainly won't have time to give the whole proof. It's probably the longest um, and most technically demanding part of our paper, um, but I hopefully give you a flavour of the kind of arguments that one uses. Um, and I'm not really going to talk about Roth's theorem or Fourier analysis at all in this talk, but you might want to keep in mind that for our application, the non-smoothing set is going to be the spectrum of a set of large Fourier coefficients. But we won't actually need that at all here. So we don't actually care where our set came from, just that it is an additively non-smoothing set, which again, I'll explain what that is later on in this talk. Okay, so let's fix some conventions. Um, we're going to be working inside some abelian group G. Uh, the convolution and the inner products, I'm going to use the discrete normalization. So in particular, F star G is just the sum over all pair, all Y, uh, F of Y and G of X minus Y. And when I write the inner product, I just mean the um, discrete sum here. I, all functions I consider will be real valued as well. So I don't have to even worry about what my conventions are about conjugate signs. And that's it. That's um, it in terms of the notation I need. And in particular, I don't need any sort of Fourier analysis or characters or anything. Right? So all our um, talk takes place entirely on the physical side, if you like, purely combinatorial. Okay, so let delta be any finite set. Again, I've, I've, I've chosen the letter delta just to remind you about where it comes from in our application, but it really is just a completely arbitrary finite subset of a finite abelian group G. Okay, so um, one of the most important quantities of its structure is uh, what's called the additive energy. And this came from the last talk. Uh, and as we were just um, discussing in the break, uh, it's really, it's nothing mysterious or um, anything to be scared of. It's really just a very natural measure of the additive structure of a set. Okay, so I denote it by E sub four of delta. So using my conventions, this is just the inner product of the convolution of delta with itself, um, with itself. Unpacking the definition, this is exactly counting the number of four tuples uh, inside delta, such that A plus B equals C plus D. Okay, so it's sort of a very natural symmetric linear equation. We're just counting the solutions to that. And in particular, we have the trivial bounds. Um, so it's certainly at least delta squared, right? Just from the uh, trivial solutions where A equals C and B equals D. Um, and the trivial upper bound as well as delta cubed, um, because if I fix A, B, and C, then D is of course also fixed. Okay. So that's sort of the scale which E4 of delta lives at. And it's important to note as well, obviously both of those bounds are actually achieved, right? If I take a subgroup, then it's additive energy is delta cubed. Um, and if I take a completely dissociated set of independent elements, then there'll be no non-trivial solutions to them at all. And I'll have, um, well, some constant times delta squared uh, many solutions. Um, given these bounds, it's convenient to normalize additive energy. So I'm gonna write tau to be E4 of delta divided by delta cubed. Okay, so in particular, tau is always at most one. So tau is some sort of uh, measure of the additive of how much additive structure delta has. Now, the normal regime for additive combinatorics and most results concern themselves with what happens when tau is actually quite large. In particular, tau is at least some constant, or at least it decays very slowly with the size of delta. Okay, so um, almost all results in additive combinatorics cease to become applicable when tau is smaller than a polynomial in log size of delta. So that's sort of what additive combinatorics in the main concerns itself with. What happens when tau is greater than greater than one? The classic examples of um, sort of sets that occur are, well, when delta is a 
a subgroup or a coset of a subgroup when actually tau is equal to one. And also if tau is a um, arithmetic regression of low dimension or a dense subset of that. So in particular, like if tau is a, a delta is a dense subset of a d-dimensional arithmetic regression, then tau is at least say two to the minus d. So if d is constant, then that's also greater than greater than one. And one of the main results of additive combinatorics, um, sort of the family of inverse sumset theorems, which are usually called Prime and Ruger theorems, in fact, characterize uh, exactly what kind of sets we get um, occurring in this tau greater than greater than one regime. And they say that basically it's, it's these kinds of examples and um, sort of trivial modifications thereof. So this is a very loose uh, way of stating it, but roughly the Freiman Ruge inverse theorem says that if tau is greater than greater than one, then there exists some structured set P. Um, speaking very vaguely here, but you can basically P is a coset of a subgroup um, or a, an arithmetic progression of bounded dimension, such that um, P has roughly the same size as A, and also P can like a large part of A is a subset of P, if you like. So that sort of explains why A has large additive energy. The only reason from this Freiman Ruge theorem is that A has large intersection with a, um, a structured piece, like which is either a subgroup or an arithmetic progression. So that's what happens when tau is roughly constant. And generally, we're now very good um, at dealing with this sort of regime. We have lots of um, tricks we can play, lots of techniques. And we're fairly comfortable in it. Certainly, by no means is, is this solved. I think like one of the main main open problems of additive combinatorics, the polynomial Freiman Ruge conjecture, uh, is sort of really asking exactly how precise is this relationship in the previous slide. But I think certainly in a qualitative sense, um, the picture is almost complete in some sense about the, this regime. Uh, so, a uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that it uh, the standard uh, tools apply only to constant tau or something up to logarithmic delta is that the dimension goes exponentially in one over tau. This is an echo. It's bad. Yeah, sorry. So, are you saying the dimension I'm asking, like the I'm asking, too? I'm asking. No, no, no. I'm just asking why it doesn't apply for really small tau. Uh, is it the case that the uh, uh, the dimension grows exponentially in one over tau. Um, yes, for example, that's one of many things that can go wrong. Okay. Yeah. So, so in general, obviously, there are lots of quantitative losses, and certainly, at best, we expect them to be possibly exponential in one over tau. And in particular, if that's if ex, if exponential in one over tau is like one over delta, then everything becomes trivial at that point. Right. Like if the implied constants in this Freiman Ruge theorem are allowed to be, uh, sorry, that A should be delta. Uh, if they're allowed to be sort of polynomial in one over delta or one over A, then of course that's completely trivial, this Freiman Ruge theorem. Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so unfortunately this regime is not actually of interest to us. For our particular application, for example, when delta is the large spectrum of Fourier coefficients, if you go back to the previous talk and look at the bounds on the energy that I wrote down, you can work out that in fact tau is delta to the minus two thirds. So for this application, we're really concerned with sets where this tau, this energy parameter, is actually um, some polynomial in the size of delta. Okay, so much, much smaller in particular than even a power of log. So far too small for these sort of classical tools of additive combinatorics to be of any use at all. Note that it's not trivial. I mean, the trivial lower bound for tau is delta to the minus one. So we do have some kind of additive structure here, but very, very weak additive structure that we're picking up on. And in particular, the, kind, the amount of structure that we're detecting is far too weak for delta to actually resemble itself a structured set. Okay. So in particular, delta itself does not look like a coset or an arithmetic progression. That's not what spectra looks like but they contain some kind of structure that looks like that. 
And instead of expecting that delta itself sort of globally is structured, what this kind of energy um, is telling us is that there should be structured parts of delta. As we saw in the previous talk, that's what happens. We have some relatively sparse subsets of delta with very good dimension bounds, for example. But again, standard methods of additive combinatorics aren't very good at detecting sort of this small local structure, right? They're sort of, they're completely lost in this global um, noise. So instead we need a new kind of technique and a new kind of results. And to my knowledge, this was really first developed by Bateman and Katz in this 2010 paper. I would, incidentally, I would be really interested to hear if anyone knows of any place that this kind of idea appeared before Bateman and Katz. Um, I don't know, maybe in some application to the circle method or somewhere in computer science or who knows, maybe this kind of idea has already been had independently. And I'd be, I don't know of any such place, but I'd be really interested to hear about it. So if anything you see in this talk sort of you know, chimes any bells um, about something you read before, um, then please, please do uh, let me know. So the key point here is that the kind of regime that Bateman and Katz investigated is not where tau is large globally, you know, just sort of compared to one, but it's large relative to other additive energies, which I'm going to define now. And all I care about really is the eightfold additive energy. So obviously you can define a whole family of additive energies, but all I care about in this talk is E4 and E8. So E8 is just the straightforward generalization of E4, where instead of four summands, I now have eight summands. Okay, so it's just counting the number of eight tuples uh, a up to h such that the sum of the first four equals the sum of the second four. Okay, so just you just double the number of summands in the definition of conventional additive energy. Okay. And again, this has the same kind of trivial bounds. So in this case, E8 is at least delta to the four, and it's trivially at most delta to the seven. Okay, so as I said, if tau is meant to roughly measure how much additive structure delta has, then one would expect that if tau is large, delta is structured, and therefore not only is E4 large, but also E8 should be large as well. Uh, and there's in fact, there's a fairly precise form of this, um, which is just two applications for the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Uh, I'll leave it as an exercise. Um, it's very simple, especially once you've been told it's just two applications for the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. Uh, but the following bound is true, that E8 of delta is at least tau cubed times the size of delta to the seventh. Okay, so again, trivially it's at most the size of delta to the seven, uh, and tau cubed is like this uh, proportion parameter, which if, just to remind you, it'll come up a lot, so it's worth reminding you that uh, tau is E4 of delta divided by delta cubed. So it's the sort of tau is this normalized E4. So this is saying that the normalized E8 is at least tau cubed. <coughs> Um, so in particular, when we say that tau is large relative to E8, it has to be, all right, but this relationship always holds. But we have the following definition, and this is the key definition of what non-smoothing is. So we say that a set delta is, say, M additively non-smoothing if we have this sort of matching upper bound to our lower bound above. So the size of E8 of delta is at most M times this like trivial lower bound of tau cubed times delta to the seventh. So that's what an additively non-smoothing set is. Okay, it's one where um, E4 could be anything. We have no real control over what E4 is. But once I've fixed what E4 is, E8 is basically as small as it can be, given how large E4 is. Um, I'm not going to attempt to be quantitatively precise, so I'm just going to speak very informally and just say that delta is additively non-smoothing if E8 is like big O of tau cubed delta to the seven. But of course, to be precise, there's some sort of hidden parameter here and how large that parameter is will affect all the other implied constants in this talk. So for uh, example- Tom, yep. uh, question. Yep. You want uh, E8 to be small, the smaller it can be, yep. uh, given the uh, E4. Um, yep. This hints at, uh, I mean, making energy small says that there is less structure. 
Um, no, because I think the way to think about this is it's really saying that E4 is large compared to E8 is perhaps the way to think about it. Ah, okay. There you go. Um, so it's measuring, I guess, it's certainly a different kind of structure. So in a way, it's sort of measuring structure alongside a different axis, right? So it, that axis is um, how large E4 is and the more the better. Then how non-smoothing it is, is sort of measuring a completely orthogonal kind of structure, if that makes sense. Um, so what's an example of an additively non-smoothing set? So the trivial one is, well, if tau itself is very large, right? Because certainly if tau is, you know, basically constant, then because we trivially have E8 being at most delta to the seven, then certainly uh, any set delta where tau is constant is additively non-smoothing, right? With some constant dependent on tau. And so in particular, any structured set which is covered by the normal regime of additive combinatorics like subgroups or arithmetic regressions, et cetera, is automatically additively non-smoothing. Okay, so any sort of conventional, very structured set is definitely additively non-smoothing, but we have a lot more besides. Uh, it's not immediately obvious that there are any other examples, I think. Um, and one could, when the first one sees this thing, say, well, maybe there is some like clever trick you can play to show that if I'm additively non-smoothing, in fact, that forces tau to be large and therefore my set is structured. Fortunately for us, the answer is no. So we've already sort of seen an example, which is when delta is equal to the spectrum. So in that case, uh, the E4 of delta is roughly delta to the seven over three. The eightfold energy E8 is also small. So it's like delta to the five. Okay, so if you unpack and so here tau is like delta to the minus two thirds, and this is uh, roughly tau cubed times delta to the seven. Okay. So we've already seen an example um, of sort of non trivial and non structured sets which are relatively non smoothing, which are spectra of um, Fourier coefficients, which is why we're interested in the, the application to Roth's theorem. But again, sort of the purpose of this talk, even. You can forget about that entirely and just think about the concept of additive non-smoothing as an object of study in its own right. But that's why we care about it, because spectra are additively non-smoothing. So we've already seen this easy example. So if delta is a dense subset of a subgroup or an arithmetic regression, then it's additively non-smoothing, okay? because tau is itself constant. So it's important to see a non-example, just to convince you that not all sets are additively non-smoothing. So in particular, random subsets are, you know, I guess, principal example here. So if I take a random subset of a group, choosing each element with probability tau, then um, straightforward exercise in probability to check that with high probability E4 of delta is going to be roughly tau times delta cubed. And E8 of delta is, uh, again, tau times delta to the seven. Okay, so much, much larger than this lower bound of tau cubed times delta to the seven. So random sets are not additively non-smoothing. Uh, the idea behind the name, why it's called non-smoothing, is that uh, the convolution operator is, as is well known, an analytically smoothing operator, right? So they expect delta convolved with delta to be smoother than delta. A set being non-smoothing, that means that, okay, so I've applied one convolution, I'm looking at delta convolved with delta, i.e. I'm looking at E4. It's non-smoothing if I don't gain by doing that again and again and again. Okay, I'm not sort of creating any extra smoothing here by repeatedly using the convolution operator or equivalently by adding the set to itself many times. This is why random sets are not additively non-smoothing because they do smooth out eventually. If I take an additive set, if I take a random set and I add it to itself um, and I keep doing that, eventually I'm going to fill out the whole group pretty quickly in fact. And as soon as I've done that, then that sort of say the fourfold sum set is much more structured than the set I started with. And that might not happen immediately, but it will happen eventually some way down the road. So random sets are not additively non-smoothing, they're additively smoothing because eventually it won't happen straight away, but eventually their sum set becomes much smoother, which becomes, becomes much more structured. Additively non-smoothing means that um, I'm not going to create any additional structure by adding the set to itself other than the amount that I have to. Okay, so high level heuristic overview of what's going on. 
to sort of to motivate uh, the reason behind the name additive philosophy room. Uh, it's that, I, I, again, this uh, concept of additive non-smoothing was, to my knowledge, first studied by Bateman and Katz, uh, and they chose this terminology for it. Okay, so we've seen a, a trivial example, but I'm now going to convince you that there are many more examples. And in particular, there are examples of, ad, of sets which are additively non-smoothing for any choice of tau. Okay, so it happens not just at tau being constant, but at any tau between uh, tau being equal to one and tau being very small, all the way down to one over delta. Okay, so here's the first example. Let H be a structured set. So think of this as, for example, being a subgroup. And let R be a, a random set, uh, a set which is completely dissociated, a set of a set which is linearly independent, has no structure at all. And suppose also that H and R are orthogonal, so they're existing in entirely sort of different parts of my uh, universe. And in particular, when I add them to it, um, they only interact in trivial ways. So for example, the, the different sets only intersect at zero. And I'm going to consider this, which is my first type of example, which is H plus R. So the first thing to note is that by orthogonality, I know what the size of the sum set is. It's just the size of H multiplied by the size of R, right? There's no um, non-trivial uh, uh, degeneracies in this. So how are we going to calculate the energy of the set? So delta can evolve with minus delta is supported on the, sub, the different set, delta minus delta, which is roughly h plus r minus r, right? Because h minus h is the same as h, approximately, because h is structured. So on h, which is a subset of delta minus delta, um, the convolution is very large. It's about the size of delta, in fact, as large as it can be. Um, so this is just comes from the sort of the solutions of writing any little h as h prime plus r minus h prime minus h plus r. And because h is structured, again, think of h as being a subgroup, um, this is also going to lie inside h. And on the rest of delta minus delta, um, I just have the trivial solutions. Okay, so where I'm going to write h plus r1 minus r2, which is an arbitrary element of the different set, as h prime plus r1 minus h prime minus h plus r2. Again, both of these are elements of my original set delta. And so in particular, the convolution is roughly the size of H. Um, okay, so these are slightly finickety calculations, possibly, but I really encourage you to, uh, to um, verify them later on. They're very instructive calculations. Okay, so E4 of delta, um, in particular, this is the sum of this convolution squared. Right, that's the definition of what e4 of delta is. So I'm going to get a contribution of the size of h times delta squared. Right, that's coming from this first part, where the convolution is very large, it's size of delta over h many elements. And I also get this contribution from the rest of delta minus delta. So the size of delta minus delta is h times r squared, which is this. And then the convolution squared contributes, contributes h squared. And then recalling that uh, the size of delta is h times r, this simplifies to, in fact, both contribute the same amount, which is the size of delta cubed over the size of r. That's what the size of, that's what e4 of delta is. So in particular, tau, this parameter is 1 over r. And I can choose tau to be anything we like um, if I just choose the size of r to be around tau to the minus 1. So that's the point where I choose how big r is. So this is actually a family of examples um, and I can construct this example with any tau that I like, ranging from tau being really small, like 1 over delta, uh, and then this construction just collapses to delta being equal to r, that's just a dissociated set with a very small energy, all the way up to tau being basically 1, uh, when r is um, not existing anymore, and then delta is just equal to this h, where the structure is, you know, the energy is maximal. Okay, so it's a family of examples. Of the form h plus r. Oh, so I've calculated. Yep. Uh, so in contrast to what happened uh, till now, um, well, uh, we looked for a structured set in the in all of delta. We are now looking for a small structured set uh, that 
basically random shift of, uh, the, the union over uh, some random shift. Yeah. And this is a much weaker structure. This is yeah. what we're going to find. Yeah, exactly. So in the end, we sort of hope that this is in fact what delta must look like. So, um, and the point is H is much, much smaller than delta. Um, the sort of delta is generated from H by taking many random shifts. Um, but this is, yeah, so this is a construction so far. So we've calculated what E4 of delta is. Uh, E8 of delta we can calculate in a very similar way. Um, okay, so I'll spare the details, but the point is, as one would expect, it's 1 over R cubed times delta to the 7. In particular, it's tau, roughly tau cubed times delta to the 7. Okay, so this gives us an example of an additively non-smoothing set. So if I, any case where I have H plus R, where H is structured, R is dissociated, and they're orthogonal, is an additively non-smoothing set. Okay. And then what tau is will depend on the size of R here. Okay, so that's one type of example. There's another family of examples, which is actually looks quite different. So here instead, I'm going to start with um, a collection of um, structured sets. So think of this as a collection of subgroups, for example. And they're disjoint and pairwise as orthogonal as possible. So again, apart from the, where they trivially have to intersect, um, sort of additively, they exist in completely different um, chunks of the universe. And suppose that they're all the same size, so all of size roughly x. And I'm just going to consider their, their union, which is a disjoint union. And so in particular, it has size roughly L times X. So again, you can calculate the convolution. Um, I'll skip the details, but it's, again, an instructive calculation to do. Um, and this time, it turns out that E4 of delta is roughly 1 over L squared times delta cubed. So unlike before, where I had the, the disjoint union of R many translates of the same H, now I'm taking the disjoint union of L many um, cosets, which aren't necessarily translates of the same sort of ground set H. They could be completely different subgroups. And this means that the calculation for the entity changes somewhat. And in particular, now I want to take tau to the minus one half many um, pieces and take the union of them. And similarly, the E8 one can estimate the same way, and it turns out to be tau cubed times delta to the seven. And again, this is a family of examples because <clears throat> I can vary tau or equivalently vary L um, and take the disjoint union of a different number of pieces and I get a whole family of different examples. Okay, so the, here's the key takeaway. There are two distinct families of examples of additively non-smoothing sets. Okay. The first looks like H plus R, where H has size tau times delta and R has size tau to the minus one. So in particular, this example looks like the disjoint union of uh, tau to the minus one many structured sets, each of which is a random translate, if you like, of the same H. And it's interesting. And to see what the difference is, note that in this example, most of the mass of E4 comes from actually two places. They both contribute the same amount. Um, part of it it comes from where the convolution is really, really large, roughly size delta. But also an equal contribution is made from where um, the convolution is very small, so tau times delta. Okay, so both of these sort of pieces contribute to the energy in this example. And the second example is where I take the disjoint union of structured pieces. So now the size of each HI is roughly tau to the one half times delta. I have roughly tau to the minus a half many of them. So unlike the first example, where I had the disjoint union of tau to the minus one many structured sets, and I have the disjoint union of tau to the minus one half many structured sets. So I have fewer of them, but I have no relate. I have no information about the how they interact with each other. Right. So unlike the first example, where they all translate to the same H, in the second example, they're just completely arbitrary, um, different subgroups. And in this case, the mass of the energy comes entirely from where the convolution isn't very big or very small, but in fact it's of medium size, roughly tau to the one half times delta. Okay. So again, these 
various parameters are not meant to be obvious, um, but they are what happen if you do the calculation, and it's a very instructive and educational um, calculation to carry out. So I encourage you to play around with these examples. And the main point of the result I'm going to talk about today is that these two examples and sort of various interpolations between them are really the only ways that I can be additively non-smooth. Okay, so what's a precise way of stating this? I want to sort of write down a statement which captures both examples. And here the key observation is that in both types of example, there is some set X, which is in delta, and a structured set H, which is in delta, such that the product of their sizes is tau times delta squared. And the energy between them, so this is just counting the number of solutions such that x1 minus x2 equals h1 minus h2, that's maximal. Okay, so that's trivially at most the size of x times the size of h squared. And we're just saying that it actually achieves that upper bound up to a constant. Okay, so we have two pieces, x and h, such that their product is of some fixed size and the relative energy between them is maximal. Okay, so between them there's a lot of structure. Um, so for example, in the first family of examples for h plus r, you take x to be delta and h to be, well, the h. And in the second family of examples, we take x to be the same as h, which is just h i for any fixed i. And both of these um, choices have the same property. So again, the, the actual sizes of x and h themselves do vary between examples, but what's always true is that the product of them is tau times delta squared. And this is the structural theorem that Bateman and Katz proved. So they proved roughly that if delta is additively non-smoothing and e4 of delta is tau times delta cubed, then we can find some x and h inside delta such that the product of them is has size tau times delta squared, and the relative energy between them is basically maximal. So it's the size of x times the size of h squared. So between x and h, um, we're very structured. This is proof for uh, f to the n. Um, in fact, their proof, um, so they only applied it in f3 to the n, but in fact their proof does work in an arbitrary finite abelian group. They don't use a um, small torsion anywhere. Okay. <clears throat> um, so we've suppressed the quantitative dependence here as it gets a little messy to state. Um, it's actually not too bad, but also not great. Um, probably this is true with polynomial dependence, but uh, certainly neither the proof of Bateman and Katz or the proof of myself and uh, Olaf Sisask give polynomial dependence. And it wouldn't actually be too significant, even if one did have this with polynomial dependence. It would help things slightly, but not by a lot. So it's not really a, a crucial open problem at the moment. Uh, and as I say, this was proved by Bateman and Katz in the 2010 paper. As far as I know, it's the first paper which um, really recognized the importance of non-smoothing and to really say that maybe such a result might even be possible. Because again, it's worth stressing again and again that this result applies whatever tau is. So even e4, even if the energy e4 of delta is really small, then this could still give you something, some useful information about your set, as long as you also have a corresponding upper bound on e8. And this is absolutely, this is very rare in additive combinatorics that we can say anything at all about sets with very small energy, which is what makes this sort of result so valuable. Can I ask a question about this? Yeah. Um, so first I will say something and see if it makes sense to you. If Ryman Rivers somehow says that if A plus A is not very large, then A plus A, plus a is also not very large. Here you're saying A plus A can be very large, but if A plus A plus A plus A is not crazy large in the sense that you can compare it somehow, then it has structure. And now the question is, can you now deduce it from this that the, the thick 16 energy is controllable? Like the Raymond Rouge thing? 
So you're, I, as in you're asking, if I say have control over the E4 energy and the E8 energy, can I control the E16 energy? So it, it, the structure you find, or the, they found, does it allow to control the, let's say, 16 or some other energy? Ah, I see. Um, not directly. I mean, the, the problem with energies is that uh, they always sort of have a lower bound. So even if I found some large piece inside delta, say like half of delta, say, which is very structured, um, that doesn't rule out the possibility that in like the mysterious unexplored half of delta, there is some kind of reason that the E16 energy would be very, very big. Um, so it's quite hard to rule out just from knowing say, applying this theorem and knowing about E4 and E8 to saying really significant things about E16. Um, I'm not saying that it, it wouldn't be possible, but I certainly don't think it's an immediate consequence and you would have to be quite careful. Thank you. Um, so further work on this Bateman and Katz type theorem has been done by Shkredov and um, a paper of Shern and Shkredov, um, where they prove a lot of similar sort of results um, in particular, for example, if one has additional hypotheses to this, let's say the L3 norm of the convolution is also controlled, uh, then in fact there's quite simple proofs of this kind of structural decomposition. So if you're interested in this kind of statement, then I, I highly encourage uh, investigating the papers of Shkredov and Chern and Shkredov as well. Um, and the key point of the conclusion of this theorem is that the energy lower bound, so x times x squared is now once again in the regime of traditional additive combinatorics. Okay, so once you've applied this kind of non-smoothing structural result, now you can start to bring in all your other toolkits and all your other pieces from additive combinatorics, uh, like the asymmetric Balog theorem, the Gauss theorem, the Freiman Ruge theorems, um, etc. Um, so you can you can do a lot with this conclusion once you have it. Like you can assume that H is in fact approximately a subgroup itself, for example, if you desire. So Depending on, depending on your application, there's a lot you can then do with it. But it's this sort of bridge from going from uh, very small energy to almost constant energy, almost constant off best possible energy that's the significant part here. So this is in a sense a complete um, answer to what the additively non-smoothing sets look like, right? I gave examples to show that here are some examples and there's the bateman katz structural theorem which says that these are the only examples in a qualitative sense. The trouble is it's not suitable for application for finding three term progressions in the integers. Um, this is not because, um, as we heard earlier, it doesn't apply to say Z mod MZ. As I've written it, it applies just as, it applies to a completely arbitrary abelian group, right? So delta could be a subset of Z mod MZ or subset of the integers if you like as well. And this theorem would still hold um, of Bateman cats. The trouble is that we don't actually have information about the actual energies as I've defined them here anymore, because we're not working relative to groups, we're working with relative to Bohr sets, which are definitely not groups. They're, they're group-like in many respects, but they're not groups. And that means in particular that when I get all these bounds about energies, I sort of lied in the previous talk because I don't actually know what E4 of delta is um, when I'm working relative to some Bohr set. I actually know what the, like, the energy is relative to some approximate kernel. So I actually have sort of lower and upper bounds for things like E4 of delta relative to gamma, which counts the number of four tuples A, B, C, D, such that A plus B minus C minus D isn't necessarily equal to zero, but it is a member of gamma, right? So gamma is some sort of approximate ball around, around zero, for example. Okay, so sort of, it's the regular E4 of delta, but, um, with this sort of quotient operation by gamma. So for example, when gamma is just equal to zero, this is the same as our E4 of delta. And in fact, when gamma is in general a genuine subgroup, as you might imagine, you can sort of quotient out in this definition, you can quotient out delta by gamma and reduce to this case uh, of just the regular E4 of delta. And this is basically why it's not an issue for Bateman and Katz because you can basically always assume that you're working relative to an actual subgroup because there are so many of them in F3 to the N. Um, so really you can always ensure that you're working with genuine E4 of delta, not some approximate version of it. But this is not possible in Z mod NZ, right? I mean, in general, like when N is prime, there are no subgroups at all. So certainly um, we can't uh, reduce from 
reduced to the case e4 of delta, we genuinely have to work with e4 of delta relative to gamma. So uh, in my paper with Elsie Sask, we proved a more general and robust version of the structural theorem. Um, so I've stated it roughly here. So this is essentially the same as the theorem of Bateman and Katz, um, with the key difference being that all the energies now are relative to gamma. Where gamma is um, some kind of approximately structured kernel. Okay, so think of it as being some sort of like ball around the identity. Um, and I'm also going to assume that delta and gamma are mutually orthogonal. Okay, so sort of delta is gamma separated, if you like, which is not a which is a reasonable um, thing to ensure ensure in practice. And I still have the same kind of information. So I have e4 of delta relative to gamma is still around tau times delta cubed. e8 of delta relative to gamma is still basically tau cubed times delta to the seven. Um, and I get the same sort of conclusion. So there are x and h such that the product of their sizes is tau times delta squared. And now their relative energy like, uh, relative to gamma is still basically maximum. So that is basically the Bateman and Katz structural theorem still holds even if we quotient out the energies by gamma, where gamma is um, definitely not a subgroup, it's some like approximately structured kernel. And that's what we need to get this sort of strategy of Bateman and Katz off the ground in the integers because there is not much actual rigid algebraic structure around and we have to work with the sort of approximate energies to allow it. Um, so I'm going to say a couple of words about what the kind of structure we need in gamma. It's really not obvious at all uh, what kind of structure we need. So, and I think I, I think this is sort of one of the ones that one of the things that held us up for quite a while, which is, as is often the case in mathematics, sort of once you have the right definition in hand, it's often quite clear how to proceed. But it can take a lot of sort of trial and error and experimentation to work out exactly what kind of um, definition is the correct definition. And in particular, we needed something which was strong enough that we could actually use it to prove the structural theorem, but weak enough that we can ensure it for our application, right? So the kind of gammas that arise in our proof of Roth's theorem, we need to be able to prove this kind of approximate structure for them. So there's a, a balancing act to be done there. Uh, the kind of gammas that arise are basically dual versions of Bohr sets. So think of them as being arithmetic progressions, some medium dimension, or if you like medium dimensional sort of balls around the origin. And uh, this led us to the notion of what we call an additive framework. And in fact, um, the correct way to think about it is to think of gamma as not as a, a, kernel, a single kernel, but think of it as a pair of kernels. So gamma sub t and gamma sub b. So t is for top, b is for bottom. And we sort of think of them as this is gamma t up here, which contains gamma sub b at the bottom. And we want to, between them, construct an additive framework. Okay, so this is a terminology that we introduce in our paper. And basically it's sort of a, it's a scaffold on which um, the proof of the structural theorem can be carried out. Roughly, it, it looks like this. So an additive framework of height h is a sequence of sort of nested subsets. So I start with gamma t at the, at the top, and then inside that I have gamma 1, inside that I have gamma 2, and so on, sort of h levels of that, down to gamma b at the bottom. Um, and there are a couple of conditions to ensure. So for example, I want um, gamma i plus 1 minus gamma i plus 1 to live inside gamma i. Okay. So not only is um, gamma i plus 1 contained inside gamma i, but its different set is also. And furthermore, if I take something inside this different set, and I look at how many representations it has in gamma i minus gamma i, then it has basically the current, you know, maximal number of representations. Okay, so very quantitative um, things to keep track of there, but intuitively what's going on is that if I shift um, something on level i by something on level i plus one, then that doesn't really change it. Okay, so the collection of things on level i plus one um, are basically, they can't affect what's happening on level i in any sort of significant way. Okay. So here's a couple of examples. Um, if, if gamma is a subgroup, I can just take gamma t to be equal to gamma b and then just 
I can construct that as a framework of arbitrary height because I can just take all the levels to be the same gamma. So I don't need there to be a gap between them. The point is gamma minus gamma is, can, is equal to gamma because it's a subgroup and you know, shifts on level gamma by things in gamma don't change it because it, it's a subgroup. Um, a more interesting example is a sequence of intervals around zero in, in the integers. Okay, so I start with a very narrow interval around zero. I then sort of blow it up to a wider interval and then dilate it again and again and again. Um, and that forms an additive framework where sort of the height depends on the size of the dilate and how many times I applied it. Okay, so that's sort of what I mean by shifts not changing it that much, right? If I shift by something which is very close to zero and I compare and I do that by something which is quite far from zero, and that's not really going to affect its size that much. And crucially for us, the kind of gammas that arise, which are large spectra of Bohr sets, um, also accommodate uh, to frameworks of large heights. So this definition is in fact applicable to our situation, which again is, is not obvious and, and requires some work in itself to show that these additive frameworks actually exist. The proof that we use um, is actually different from that of Bateman and Katz, even in the case when gamma equals zero. So sort of essentially, we had to come up with a, a new alternative proof for that sort of case that generalized to this um, approximate situation more easily. And it's certainly heavily inspired by the text and techniques they use. Um, so sort of we, we do, we do uh, everything that Bateman and Katz do, but sort of in a different order and uh, combined with some other ideas. And in particular, uh, both proofs, so the proof of Bateman and Katz and the proof in our paper, are entirely elementary. So no Fourier analysis is used, um, nothing particularly complicated, just repeated use of the pigeonhole principle and the Cauchy Schwartz inequality in quite an, sort of an elaborate, um, intricate way. Um, so for the rest of this talk, how long have I got? Or well, possibly, well, two minutes now. Uh, I'll try to give a flavour of the kind of arguments that we use. Um, so I, I could, I guess, sort of stop here, um, or I can continue talking for um, five more minutes or something. Take five minutes, and then we Okay, so I'll talk for five more minutes. Um, I'll give a start on the proof, and then, and then I'll stop. Um, so my goal here is just to show the kind of steps that we use in the proof um, and how the actual non-smoothing hypothesis of E8 and the upper bound of E8 is actually used. So we start with um, a set where we know what E4 of delta is, right? It's tau times delta cubed. And we want to find some kind of structured pieces within delta. Okay, so we're going to do that by, our structured pieces are going to be of the form delta intersect delta plus x. Um, that's a very standard um, way to uh, find a structured subset of delta with some kind of additive structure. And x is going to be chosen uh, from uh, some, what we call a symmetry set. Okay, so I use this notation S sub delta here to mean it's a subset of the different set delta minus delta. And it's the set of all those x such that the convolution, so the number of representations inside delta minus delta is um, at this point, it, I run into problems reading these slides out loud compared to when I wrote them. Little delta times big delta. Okay. So it's little delta um, sort of of the maximal possible size. So it's sort of a physical analog to the spectra that we saw where you're sort of measuring those characters with a Fourier coefficient of fixed size. In this case, we're measuring those x inside delta minus delta where the number of representations is of some fixed some size. The first step is to note that by dyadic pigeonholing on this energy assumption, there is in fact some level little delta, which is at least tau, such that the size of this symmetry set is large. So in particular, S delta is at least little delta to the minus two times tau into the set. Okay, so what I now do is I fix this S in this level little delta, and I look at the inner product of S with delta convolved with minus delta. So trivially, that's at most uh, sorry, there's a typo here, that should be the size of S is missing there. So little delta times big delta times the size of S, just from the definition of S. 
Now I can just adjoint that inner product and take one delta over to the other side. So I have the inner product of delta with S convolved with delta. And then I apply the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to that. And I get this lower bound here. So the inner product of delta with the square of S convolved with delta is at least little delta squared, big delta S squared. And I just expand this out to the inner product and write what do I actually have. And I get, look at this second line here is what I get. So this is the sum of all A, B and pairs, A, B inside S. And it's the convolution of delta sub A with minus delta at B, okay? Where delta sub A is an intersection of the kind I described earlier. So delta intersects delta plus A. And it's saying that the sum of all this over all S squared pairs is at least little delta squared times big delta times S squared. And this kind of maneuver that we did, so sort of I apply some sort of trivial lower bound, take the adjoint, then apply Cauchy-Schwarz and then rearrange. We use that a lot in the proof. So it's that, that's kind of what I mean by elementary methods. Okay, we pigeonhole to find a good level, adjoint, Cauchy-Schwarz, rearrange, and over and over again. So since um, A is inside S, by definition, we know what the size of delta A is, right? The size of this intersection is by definition exactly the convolution of delta convolved with minus delta at A, which we know by choice of S is roughly little delta times big delta. So consider this convolution. So trivially, it's at most the size of delta A, which is little delta times big delta. And our inequality says that when I sum over all pairs in S squared, um, this convolution is at least on average little delta squared times big delta. Okay, so there's two kind of ways this lower bound can arise. One is that most of the mass comes from a small set of pairs where the convolution is very large, or maybe it's sort of spread out over all possible pairs inside S squared where the convolution is, you know, fairly small, but little delta squared. In the first case, um, basically this is good and we exit. Uh, so we have some structured piece delta A, we take that out of delta and we do the rest of the proof. You have to do a lot more work, but for our purposes, that's done. The key point is that the second case can't really happen if we're additively non-smoothing. So suppose that for all pairs A, B inside S squared, the size of this convolution is large, so little delta squared. In particular, the size of this convolution of delta A convolved with delta at B is at most delta convolved with minus delta at A minus B. Okay, so this inequality is um, sort of trivial to prove. You just write out the definitions but it's completely essential to our whole approach. And what this means is that basically all pairs A, B inside S squared, actually their difference A minus B lies inside the delta squared level symmetry set. Okay, so A and B come from the delta level symmetry set S, A minus B lies inside the delta squared level symmetry set. And then by the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, that means that the size of the delta squared level symmetry set is large relative to the E4 of S. And this is where the non-smoothing comes in, because E4 of S I can control by E8 of delta, because S is a subset of, of the different set of delta. So by bounding E8 of delta, I'm secretly bounding the E4 of the symmetry set S, which I know is small. Therefore, the delta squared symmetry set is large, and I can then iterate. Okay, so that's, I started by knowing that the size of S delta is large, and now I know that the size of S squared is large, and so I just repeat that and repeat that until I exit. And the point is I can't do that forever because delta can't decrease past tau for a, sort of other elementary reasons. Okay, so that's sort of very rushed, but I, the main point I wanted to take is that that's where the non-smoothing comes in. It allows us to control E4 of S, which in turn means that I can sort of run this iteration about finding a good symmetry set, then finding another large symmetry set at a lower level and repeating that until I exit with some structured piece. And then I get lots of structured pieces and I can manipulate them to cover the theorem. And that's sort of the end, just to give you a flavor of the kind of way the proof works. And I'll stop there and if there's any questions. Uh, I'll, I'll clap for everybody. Uh, yeah, that was wonderful. So uh, let's uh, open the floor to questions. This is usually the sign that everything was completely understood. <laughs> uh, 
That was the opposite. Absolutely. So, uh, well, yeah. What is the next frontier that you think would be um, able to be tackled by new methods? Um, in what? In the context of three term progressions or additive combinatorics? or? Well, you said that it fails for the five or more. Yeah. So what what new things do you think that it might be, um, you know, useful for? So I think um, immediately, well, it would take a lot of work, but I think there is a chance that these ideas could be useful for the four term progression case. Um, four term progressions are um, reasonably close to three-term progressions, that Fourier methods can still say something. So it's certainly not at all obvious how to do it, and it would require a lot of work, but I think there's a chance that these ideas would be useful for four-term progressions as well. Oh, thank you. Um, more generally, I think they have a chance of being useful anywhere, basically, you use Fourier analysis to additive problems, which covers the whole of the circle method, because really what they're saying is that um, when I look at the set of large Fourier coefficients or major arcs in the language of circle, the circle method, um, then really I can actually start to analyze that as a set in itself and start to uncover lots of sort of hidden additive structure between there's a highly structured sub piece and translates of that also exist, you know, in a good way. Somehow Roth's theorem with three-term progression is like the cleanest way of studying this sort of question because it's just a single set A with no extra hypotheses and I can just look at it as a combinatorial set. But I think um, even when you start to combine it with other hypotheses, like you're looking at primes, you're looking at squares, you're looking at you know, function fields or whatever else you have, wherever you're using Fourier analysis to study sort of additive problems, and therefore you're looking at sets of large Fourier coefficients, I think that- um, Oh, thank you. Useful. It was very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. More, more questions. But I have one. Yeah. Uh, can one think of the Bateman cut result and your longer result, the more general result, as a kind of new dense model theorem in the sense of uh, Green and Tarrant Sutter, uh, where uh, in the, rather than having a pretty large subset of some uh, sets, you rather have just this control, this relative control between E4 and E8. And it is really modeled by uh, I something where tau is really close. Uh, it's a constant. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting comparison. I think the analysis part might be in the spectral boosting part, which I didn't really talk about much. But that's sort of really saying that if I have a structured piece, then um, it has a model at a higher level of the spectrum, if you like. Yeah. So, but it's not a dense model theorem in that we're not going from sort of sparsity to sort of constant density. We're going from sort of level eta to level eta to the half. So we're going to sort of from very sparse density to medium density, if you like. And that's sort of what's going on here. And it's the same sort of thing with the non-smoothing results where we start off with very sparse things and then we sort of boost that to medium level density results, I think. Yeah, well, that's great. I mean, that's, it does sound, uh, sound like a new uh, uh, dense model theorem in, uh, in a more yeah. general sense. Yeah, yeah it, it's definitely, you know, it belongs in that family. Yeah, I think. Well, great. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, great job. Yeah.